Hey guys, Adam here. Hope you're doing okay. So thanks for checking out this video. Today we're going to do a bit of a watch and an exploration of the Get Lamp Extras DVD, uh, which is uh, an accompanying DVD to Jason Scott's uh, 2010 uh, interactive fiction documentary Get Lamp and uh, Jason recently, fairly recently, I think it was actually the beginning of this year, um, made available the uh, disc images, the ISO images for both the Get Lamp documentary and the extras, uh, which is a really kind of thing to do. Great for the community um, and uh, means obviously we can go uh, check it out. So the full disc images are on the Internet Archive uh, website. If you just go on there and look up Get Lamp documentary in the interview section, uh, I'll put a link in the description to it so you can go and uh, check it out yourself. But what I wanted to do today was a bit of a, just a click around really, just to go and check out what's on there. Um, I've had a quick look at a few videos. Um, looked great, but I haven't done 90% of it. There's a whole lot of stuff on there, so I don't know how much we'll actually get through. But... Um, yeah, let's uh, let's check it out and see what to see what we know. So the screen's going to go a little bit weird for a moment uh, because of how it works. Because I'm playing it back through VLC, I don't think OBS and VLC. Uh, I think it's kind of anti-piracy thing. It won't display under the normal uh, method of doing it. Either that or I'm a bit of a wally <laughs> and don't know what I'm doing, which of course could be. But anyway, so you're going to see my screen go a bit weird. You're going to see the OBS software that I've got. Okay, but you should now be able to see the Get Lamp screen. Yes, you have. You should still be able to hear my voice. So without further ado, uh, let's have a little bit of a click around. So let me just check. Uh, yeah, that's looking good. Okay, so <clears throat> let's go ahead and browse features. So we've got the slush pile, which is a main clip of 22 minutes. So let's just uh, let's just go through them one by one for this first screen. So we've got 16 instead of six. Let's check that out. The one thing I can say about text is that it's infinitely flexible. It's easy to splice in a word like 16 as opposed to six to say there are 16 things on the table as opposed to there are six things on the table, and you can visualize it. It's a lot harder to draw 16 things appropriately on a oh, table okay. than it yeah. is to draw six. Because with six, you know you can place them in exact locations. Not so with 16. Or what if there's 37 and a half? You can do that in text. The flexibility is... is almost infinite yeah that's true so that's probably true as well of um yeah because at the end of the day the the objects although the the size of the objects is actually almost determined by your mind so whenever it says if it says you walk into a room and you know it's a it's a, it's a living room um there's a table and chairs up against the window um there's a you know, three-piece suite, settees, all this kind of stuff. Just by saying that, immediately you've got a picture in your head, probably based on your own experience um, of what that looks like. You don't necessarily go hi. There's you, know, you don't go. You walk into a room which is well, you do get this sometimes, which is like you know, twenty feet by eighteen feet, and then but the 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 settee is six foot long and five foot high. This kind of thing. Um, so that's interesting. Yeah, okay. It basically it's open ended, isn't it? Um, this one I did see early, but I thought it was really interesting. So let's just click this one. And also there was one further thing. I never got to think about that. I never got to develop that idea. And I haven't even now, but I know, I just sense that people are going to be different because of... Uh, because of playing these games, because of writing email, because of putting their personality into email. You know how people put on personas? Mm -hmm. At that time, email was a game. And people would write to each other and, and put on, well, I can only say persona. Uh, so it was like play acting. The email was play acting. There was a wonderful emailer. Her name was Arwen, Lady Arwen, and there was the, a guy who took on the name of Strider, and it was all just a game. It was all, all a lot of fun. 
with that and to see people interact knowing this is going to change people. It's not that just that we're playing the games, but by playing these kind of games, we're going to be different people. And I am sure that young people today are different from my generation who grew up right at the point when, when television started. Like I'm 55, I was born in 1952, and I can't remember how old we were when we got a TV, but there was no TV before that. Can you imagine not having TV? Your life would be different. And we were different because of that because of watching TV and not sitting down. Like when I was a little girl, what you did in the evening is you sat down and you read books. You looked at your picture books and you did that all evening. You talked with each other. There were, I mean, there were good things and bad things about that. Um, but it certainly, having the television where everybody sat and watched TV, that changed people. And I'm, I'm just convinced that kids who, who have grown up using computer computers all the time for for daily tasks as a tool that the tool has also changed them yeah i was i i think that might have been the the most important important question for me was how is this going to change people what's it like to play a game what's it like to write a letter and get an immediate response to it and and you put yourself out as one type of person uh, and you don't have to be that to the next person you write to. It, it was just really, really fun and exciting at that time. It was just different, I think. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a tool that you use only for writing memos. I mean, it was actually unusual to write memos at that time using computers. People didn't, there weren't that many people who used computers. Yeah, that's a really interesting one. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's just more generally about the impact of computers, isn't it? And the proliferation of computers. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly, I think the big one, it's, I think everything now is, is uh, everything. I mean, obviously, when these were filmed, it was about 2006, 2007. So <clears throat> Marianne's comparing life there into life in the 70s before the computers and then in the 50s before television or popular use of television and it, it is going to be different i mean it's different now there's there's an immediacy of everything now so for example um you know if i did growing up i had um uh, commodore plus four and then i had a uh, spectrum plus two and i've had an amstrad and a master system and a mega drive and and some others actually in between that because i was always swapping and wrapping but I think I, I, firstly, for each system, I probably only ever actually bought 10 games, maybe, in the entire time that I had that system. And at most, from swapping games with friends and things like that, renting games, borrowing games, probably 20 games. It, it was a fairly limited list, um, and that was how it was. Whereas now, it's just everything's like, you can get through that many games in half a year, so... Um, it is like it's very different now how people's lives are with technology. Uh, let's try this one: the mark in the machine. Thing. It was on the uh, PDP-10. Uh, I think it was the DM machine. Uh, it was on the ARPANET. Uh, mark was the primary uh, driver, really, in terms of he wrote probably more code than anybody else did and more of the text strings and that sort of thing. And he was a very close friend of mine. I remember being at the Lab for Computer Science one night and he was in God mode. <laughs> he would uh, now and then just go in and start playing with people's minds and he could type so rapidly that he could look like he was the game. And so people would try something and he would type a response and see what happened and sometimes get an idea for a, a new puzzle or a new solution or whatever and go off and start coding it. Uh, that's really cool. Yeah, so so Mark Blank spent some time, um, I don't think he's in there now, I think he's, he's kind of uh, got, gone incognito again, but basically spent some time in the in the Facebook group that we've got, uh, the Zill group, um, back end of last year. And so that was really good, getting to uh, chat to him quite a bit. And, uh, yeah, you got the, I mean, just from his posts in the group and the interaction, the conversations that we're having, very much a technical 
uh, very much a, uh, a, a technology guy. So very much, um, bit of a, bit of a hacker, you know, bit of a late night guy, same as all the hackers were really, I think back in the day. Um, definitely a love of the tech first and foremost and the writing maybe latter, uh, later on. Um, <clears throat> But it's interesting because because that's something that they used to do on the terminals, isn't it? So I know I think it's the interview with Don Woods where Don says that um, you could, or oh, is it Don Woods or is it maybe it was Mark Blank? Um, but you could uh, you could view what the other people are doing, their terminal on your screen, and then actually you could type over it. So you could sort of interject and you could type something extra and say you know there's a there's a rock there's a blue rock in the room. And of course, they, they're playing, so they would try to go pick up the blue rock and it wouldn't understand it. So there was that little mischievous element to it. Uh, a drinking problem. Let's try this one. One of my favorite favorite bugs that I remember fairly vividly uh, was around the you know typical uh, drink bottle kind of thing. Somewhere in, in, the, in the Deadly Summer game, there's a uh, kitchen table and uh, there's a you know bottle of water somewhere in, in the kitchen or on the table or something like that. And te testing out the the you know slightly improved English language parsing of, of better than Zork. In most other games, you would typically say something like drink bottle, and that was an oversimplification, which would mean would be, which would be understood to mean drink the water out of the bottle, and mm. now you have an empty bottle, and you've drunk the water, and you've shrunk, or you died, or you feel refreshed or something. In the Better Than Zork engine for the Deadly Summer game, when I tried it, I did drink bottle rather than drink water from bottle, drink water in bottle. And the uh, it said, you drank the bottle. Now the bottle's gone. <laughs> I actually drank the bottle. So I said to myself, huh, that, that seems wrong. And I started to file a bug on that. And I said, well, let me see what else I can drink. Drink table. I actually drank the table. Uh, no way. I drank a bunch of items in the room. I think I drank a chair and I was able to drink some stuff out of my inventory. Finally, I said, uh, drink me. <laughs> and then I find myself in this empty room and there's all my stuff. Wow. That's existential. <laughs> that's an existential crisis. Uh, that's brilliant. Oh, man, I'm trying to think how that would work uh, in the code. I mean... Everything's everything's an object, um, including presumably yourself. Uh, I've never really thought about this too much. I haven't needed to play with the code too much in Zillland regarding the character that you are. Um, but yeah, that's going to be an object as well. Um, how? Yeah, usually you would you would have to fl have that as a container, um, and you'd have to specify. So somehow they've managed to specify the me object as a container it sounds like um and also that they're open <laughs> so that's interesting oh of course maybe they need to be because uh, you hold items right uh so if you pick up an item you hold the item so i guess in that sense you are a container but yeah it should recognize the difference between that and drinking and if it was the same for eat, he didn't say whether it was the same for eat, but I wonder whether it was the same for that. Anyway, that's pretty a pretty cool bug anyway, definitely. Uh, collecting software, let's try that. Nowadays, everybody has the collector mentality. eBay has, has really done that to our culture, I think. Uh, back then, you know, I'm sure nobody was thinking that uh, 15, 20, 25 years from now that any of these... Infocom packages with all their little props and trinkets would be worth anything to anybody. I'm, I'm sure they weren't mm. even considering that back then. It's fun to go looking for wow. items that you know existed, but it's even more fun to come across something that you never knew existed. I have a multi-page list of items that uh, that I would love to own someday. He's got multiple copies, isn't he? Um, I will basically be collecting until the day I die. Wow. It's fun, it's fun to have them, to take them down and, and look at them and look at them and show people this is how games used to be. This is how the game industry used to be. The yeah, disc media will sure. eventually deteriorate over time and become unreadable. 
I mean, when you look back at uh, vintage items from the 1940s or 50s, vintage toys from that era, um, I guess you can kind of use the conditions you typically find those boxes in as kind of a benchmark to go from uh, mm. as far as the packaging for computer software from the 80s. You figure in about uh, in another 50, 60 years, it'll probably look along those lines. Maybe a little better if I've done my job here preserving it well. It definitely looks like he is. Uh, let's just quickly check that everything's still going out, yeah, still recording. I always like to check because sometimes I, I, I start recording and I finish recording what I think is recording and I go and I've managed to click a button and stop the recording. So, um, yeah, wow, what a collection. Uh, I have no idea how long he's been collecting, but he's got pretty much i mean certainly he got every game there by the looks of it and he got at least uh in some cases two or three copies of each one in the packaging uh you know sealed up so i mean that's a that's a brilliant collection um i would love that uh <laughs> i haven't got the space or frankly these days the money because wow the ah you know i don't know when he started collecting hopefully he got in there nice and early but uh i mean now some of the prices actually i think he mentions this in the actual get lamp documentary the the main one where they they're talking to him and i i think he makes reference to the fact that he started collecting when they were basically affordable i mean they're all it's kind of all technically affordable i guess but affordable in the sense that it didn't feel like you had to think too much about it um you know if an item's like six six pounds or six dollars it's it's a quick purchase something 60 you know, you're thinking about it. And if it's 600, you're definitely thinking about it. Uh, let's have a look at this. Let's do, okay, let's do, oh no, let's do Adventure International Closers. Oh, it's got bless him. Let's, let's check this out. Our case was like, where'd you guys go? <laughs> we thought you were doing so well. What happened? Um, one of the problems with running your own business is you're also running your own problems. And it, it's nice being able to sleep at night and not worrying about things. Ultimately, what happened to Adventure International is my fault. I was, I was uh, the president of the company, and I made ultimate decisions. I'm sure I listened to some bad advice. I probably did not choose the best people to be working with me in, in all areas, but ultimately, uh, the blame was all mine for the, the ultimate problems we had. What basically happened since we're talking about that was uh, our pockets were not deep we were not a public company we had no outside money and we were just totally funded internally and with our growth we hit a, a bad turn in sales where we accepted some orders that were exceptionally large from a, a company that we filled and they did not sell through and they returned the merchandise which left us with a, a lot of manufacturing costs because they, they didn't meet their deals. Also, uh, remember the time that the TI-99-4 went from being a $1,000 computer to a $50 computer when they were wow. closing it out. There was a big downturn in the industry at that time. We didn't have the pockets to survive it. We didn't have any outside um, investors, and that was basically uh, a downhill slide at that point. Um, also, we had sold out some of our um, lines to Commodore Computer. They were they were actually publishing our Marvel lines and they did a really a very poor job of it. And they were unable to meet their commitments to us on what they had promised. Fortunately, it was in a three-way contract with them, Marvel and ourselves, and at least they were able to, we got some of the penalty money out of them, but it was nowhere near what they had promised to do. So that hurt us. All right. And without funding to to ride the bumps, it it's it's pretty bad. Mm, yeah, I mean, it, uh, I think it was that that time period. I mean, obviously that sort of a eighty three, eighty four time period. I, I know obviously there's the uh, I'm going to call it the North American video game crash, um, just because I want to distinguish a little bit because. Um, because I know in the UK, eight, nine, eight, in the UK, 1983 is actually regarded as a stellar sales year. Really, um, it's 84 in the UK, where not that there was a video crash particularly, but that there was just a lot of competition, 
and the companies that had maybe started early that were in that same boat that got there first. Uh, I mean, if you take Imagine, uh, the software company, you know, they were just young guys created this business, um, didn't have the, the the business background particularly, and so through a combination of the industry and the market and competition, but through stuff that they did or didn't do, they went, they went, you know, they went, they went down and sounds very, sounds very similar there. Unfortunately, it's, yeah, you've got to, when the market drops out of anything, you need those big, deep pockets to keep going. Uh, so I think that actually the interview with Lance Miklas, he, he says pretty much exactly the same thing. He just says that, you know, at that time period, unless you had deep pockets, you weren't you weren't getting through it. The screwdriver story. I'm going to start being a little bit more selective about which ones I pick now because I just uh, want to get through a few, and there's quite a few. The page kind of goes on and on and on. Uh, let's have a little look at thoughts on graphics. Let's click that one. You know, people are hungry for sensation and, you know, experience. And, and so, you know, if text is good, then text and graphics is better. And if graphics mm. are good, then 3D graphics are better still. And if that's good, then networked is good. And if networked is good, mm. you know, massively multiplayer is better. You know, people want the more immersive ones that have graphics or um, that have, you know, more complex storylines you know, I mean, we all know. I mean, graphics sell at some level. Um, and, uh, you know, as time went on and as graphics got better on some of these machines, that was a real worry. Not that the games are going to be better or more fun, but that it was going to be harder to sell our games. I mean, when, you know, we were doing kind of all, you know, sort of the height of the purity stuff, the... Uh, Infocom unleashes the world's most powerful graphics generator with a picture of your brain or uh, you know would you shell out a thousand dollars to match wits with this and you know showing a picture of like a eight color you know 16 by 24 pixel alien um, at that point the graphics that you could do on a computer were so poor that you know there was really no doubt in our minds that the text was superior we, we were rather dismissive of graphics um, and I think there was a justification for being dismissive of graphics at first. Um, but come 1988 or so, uh, uh, we were way behind where we should have been. When we, st when we first started experimenting with it, we, we, ex we started experimenting too late. Would we have gone into graphics? We did. Would we have gone more into graphics? We were planning on. Shogun mm. shipped with graphics and Journey had graphics. Years before that, we were doing Fublitsky. I, th I think, I've forgotten who said this originally, but it was, if you spend several thousand dollars for a computer with a color screen and a video card, mm. and you want to display lots of pretty pictures, are you going to settle for a text adventure? Mm. I'm no purist, and, you know, I thought it was kind of cool to, um, to see some of the efforts that they made to, to take the Zerk universe in a graphical direction. You know, when creating a game like Doom, the focus is entirely, you know, we were, ma we were making a game that was supposed to kind of rely on base instinct and the UI disappears and there's just mm. no thought. It's just pure That's adrenaline, reaction. isn't it? And that is very much the opposite of what a uh, text adventure is, which is very, you know, sit there and you think and you puzzle over stuff. You try and figure out where things are, keep track of what you have, you know, all these, you know, very, very heavy thought process on a, on a, um, on a text adventure. And when we created Doom many years later, it was, it was really completely opposite kind of play style. What is it about your product that can beat other products? And that's what you got to go with. Uh, Infocom made exactly the wrong decision in trying to go into graphic adventures. Uh, I, I can understand the, the impetus, but the right solution would have been to make text adventures much, much smarter. And they didn't do that. So, great disappointment. 
you can have a really intense interaction on a computer in, in multiple different ways. One where you're, you're trying to be very thoughtful and just stare at the screen and look at the letters and you know <laughs> try and understand what they mean and try and pull some other meaning out of those sentences and uh, and then have another intense experience where you're just high on adrenaline, fear, running, shooting, you know, totally, totally different thing. Hmm. Yeah, that was an interesting one. Um, yeah, it, I think we're, we're in a different, we're in a different time now. Again, when it was filmed, obviously it was in the mid two thousands. It, I think at the I think where we are at the moment, 2021 is, and it's been like this for a few years. There's such an array of choice, and it's so accessible. You can get really great graphics on your on your mobile phone. That it's uh, there's it's like you know it's like a banquet now. It's that we're 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 so gorged on it that it's not the hunger isn't there anymore. I just I do remember growing up in the 80s and the 90s and it was just all about it was just the graphics and therefore it was all secondary to the graphics it was all about the bit was it 8 bit 16 bit 64 bit um that was it it was just all about getting that graphics thing and we chased that for you know late 80s all the 90s probably all the 2000s as well and then with the rise of the indie game maybe at the end of the 2000s and early 2010s. I think it's okay now to, it's not, we're not, we haven't got the same hunger for it. Um, just, just judging with my own kids, for example, uh, you know, much as they love the new games, they're just as happy, just, they get just as much satisfaction almost from playing an older game or not even an older game, but a new game, but that's done with a simpler aesthetic simpler graphical look maybe it's done in the style of a 16-bit game that's okay now because it's it's all there so it's it, there's no longer that big oh my god we need to get the next thing the bigger better thing um whereas they just got caught up in it um so you can have a text game now and it's fine to do that is it commercial no, probably not not to sustain a business maybe but um yeah still not there maybe uh, nonetheless, uh, yeah, it's interesting. But that was, yeah, very much of the time. It was just the fact that that's how it was back then in the 80s. It's all about chasing the graphics. Uh, ba -ba -ba -bum. Let's click, is this writing? Okay, let's click this one. I think I know which way this is going to go. Interactive fiction has the potential to be better than literature. That's oh wow, what straight I in. Kind of always felt and believed. Literature that has all the elements of literature. Literature that has truly fine writers practicing the form and developing the form. So yes, I thought of it as a game and yes, I thought of it as a literary work. Text adventure, it's, you know, it's it is a book. I'll I'll, I'll go strongly. It is a book just done a little differently. It was a new art form. It was a new form of, uh, of the literary arts. I've read on the web, it's like, well, you know, Zork 1, the Zork games <laughs> really were not very well-written stories. And, and really, they failed the test of literature and this and that. And, and, and I laugh. It's hysterical because I didn't write it to be a story. There's no story. <laughs> Interactive fiction was a marketing term applied to text mm. adventures in yeah. the early 80s. It was, a, it, was, it was puzzles, it was intended to be entertaining, and it was a technical exercise. And, technical exercise. Um, you know, and say, well, it's very incoherent. There's, like, mythologies from all this, but it's like, yeah. I don't think um, the fact that you interact with an environment and the objects in the environment, the fact that you read it doesn't make it fiction. Any more than interacting with graphical objects makes it a movie. Okay. They kept saying, we should have one playing through of the game that you can publish as a book, Robert. Uh, and I would say, oh, no, a book is very different from just a, a printout of one experience of the plot. I said, no, just publish it. <laughs> and in a way, they were quite prepared. probably would have sold. We're in a period now where you see an ad on TV, and it's an ad for uh, a sci-fi film that's also a game. Uh, or a adventure film that's also a game, and 
unless you're more sophisticated than I am, you have a lot of trouble telling whether you're looking at uh, part of a video game or part of a film. And that uh, blurring of genre was something that uh, the programmers sort of took for granted. You know, we used to say that the people who built the stages are writing the plays. So we used to look down our nose at people who were technical, who had no sense of what story was all about, <laughs> attempting to use this medium, which we thought would, you know, would really redefine fiction. And we really believe that. Um, so you had people who were technical trying to write stories. We thought, really, it has to come the other way. Uh, and the technology is in the service of the story and the characters and, and, and the richness of the world. You know, it would be nice if, nice if I had any idea about how to write or had any <laughs> idea, you know, that it mattered what the writing was like because that just wasn't what interested me at the time. It was like, how do I build the tools and build the structure of the game so that I build this world like this. And I always loved the idea that then someone who's more talented than I am in writing could take this and do something that's really much better than I could do. Uh, writing is not easy for me. I was a programmer first. Wow, I started really? programming when the Apple II showed up. Uh, I didn't really start writing until college. And even then, I was very slow at it because the school yes. system had convinced me that writing was slow, painful, boring, and didn't really accomplish anything. And it took me a long time to figure out that I actually did want to communicate. Well, the writing is good in the games. I have tried to write a book, but I've yeah, done good old Frank. a few pages and looked at it and think to myself, boring, <laughs> terribly boring. I won't bother. <laughs> and authors think that way, and they should. I mean, they think about how do I tell the story to keep the person interested from chapter one to chapter two to chapter three. So it's pacing and plotting and how the narrative's put together. I mean, all those things are critical. Then you bring them into this, where many things could happen at any time. And someone could do the same thing 50 times. And you're trying to make, it's not, it has to have something for the people to do. And they have no idea. <laughs> mm, yeah, that was an interesting one. Uh, so I think I did a, I did a playthrough of, uh, Andrew Plotkin's, and I'm going to blank on the game name now, because I'm having that kind of day, um, changing the weather. And apparently that was the first, his first main game. And the writing in it's really good. So clearly he got that in him. And I think that's the thing. I think that it, it's almost... Uh, I mean, you can, you can just, if you've got like a brain that can think of puzzly stuff you can sort of get away still i think with entertaining games that are things like you know you're in the room just a basic description of the room some objects and a, a goal that you need to get from a to b and that can still be fine that can be perfectly fine um but when you're talking when you're trying to go down that narrative that's more down the traditional text adventure route which is great then when you go in the other direction the more the interactive fiction route yeah, that probably, I don't think it's any great surprise that most of the people doing it, not all, but most of them are well-educated academics, because um, then they've got that, probably read a lot, um, so they've got that in them, it's there, and then they can structure it uh, to do that big you know, the big verbose kind of uh, the real uh, well-written, beautiful text type stuff. So I don't know where I'm going with this. Uh, clearly, I'm not an academic, but there we go. But yeah, um, that was interesting. I like that one. Uh, let's keep going. Uh, I'm probably going to have about another half an hour on this. Oh, this one looks interesting. John Romero's Lost Text Adventure. Okay. It was a dungeon. The theme of the the theme of the text adventure was was uh, you know it was like a dungeon crawl. There was a bunch of rooms, and you're I was basically just trying to be able to move between rooms, just learning how to use variables <laughs> and and uh, print stuff to the screen and have some kind of program flow. Um, and it was not the 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 adventure did not get very long because I was having to put them on punch cards because I didn't have an account. What? So I had to save them on some wow. paper tape or punch cards, and I and I was doing them on punch cards. And uh, after I had about, I think it was like 300 cards, which is like there's a, a line 
of, of basic per card. Uh, I was going home one day and the cards all fell off the back of my bike into a bunch of water and I was like, <laughs> done. I'm done. <laughs> I'm not using cards anymore. I'm going to wait for discs. Brilliant. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? Um, firstly, I always forget how long it takes to create them. That's the first thing. Um, I get caught out with this all the time. I've got, let's call it a back burner with a ton of ideas. And I've got so many things that are started. They're not even half finished. They're like 2% finished. And it's because I get an idea. And even just the simple stuff of just a few rooms, a few objects. Um, when I did that live stream recently and... Uh, for the King's Ransom, uh, the live stream didn't go so well, actually, the lagging and all sorts. But anyway, the point was that still took from, from starting pretty much with a blank page to creating. In fact, it wasn't even finished. I still need to, to, to go back and do more. But that took over an hour um, just, for a, just for a handful of rooms and nothing major, a couple of objects. That was it. And then I still had to go back and spend another hour on it. So that was with something that was kind of like a mini game, deliberately very small game. Um, similar to that, actually, I do. So uh, in the early night, so I had, so I wrote, I, as soon as I worked out, the first text adventure game I had was Pirate Adventure Sky Adams on the Commodore Plus 4. As soon as I could work out, I, I at the time had the manual uh, for learning a bit of basic and I would have been only seven, eight years old, but, um, I uh, didn't really. I got two younger brothers, but they were much younger than I am, or well, a fair amount younger than. So, so it's kind of just me, really, for the first six, seven years of my life. And so, yeah. So I just just me in this basic book. <laughs> and uh, since I worked out how to do input a string or a dollar, whatever you want to call it, I was like, right, I can use this, and I could create a little game, and I did. And then later on, on the Amstrad PCW, um. I created some games on that, and the school had the same uh, set of computers. They all had PCWs, the 8256, and I had one at home, and there were the ones at school. And so I would create them at home, take them in, and some friends would play them. And uh, and we had a kind of a, very briefly, the beginnings of a tiny club. Never really got anywhere, but uh, that was quite a, quite a nice thing. Um, I, I should try and recreate those games in Zill, actually. Okay, take these games. Let's read this. Watch this even. Oh. But I had this one uh, just heartbreaking case of a, a woman who wrote me and said, you know, oh, I, I know have this. lupus. And uh, there are very few things that I can do because of my condition. I can't really go outside all that often. I can't do any sports or exercise or things like that. You know, it's really crippling. I can't play newer computer games, even though I'm. I'm holed up inside because it takes too fast reaction times and, uh, you know, my condition keeps me from doing that. But I can play adventure games, and I've been playing adventure games for all of these years, and I'm really excited that you're writing about these adventure games. And I'm moving into a new apartment where I can't keep all of these games that I have been, you know, that I've bought and I've played. I want to send these to you uh, because I've heard you talk about the fact that you collect these games. Will you take these from me? And I was just wow. floored that somebody, just out of the blue, someone I didn't know, um, had been affected enough by what I had been doing that they were like, here, please, take these from me. You can have them. And, and I was just astounded. That's, that's, a, that's a big deal, isn't it? That's, it, it the, the writing that he's done, and cause it's obviously Stephen Goodhart uh, has been involved since day dot, I think it's fair to say, the very early 90s. And obviously he's ran the interactive fiction competition. He's done loads of games. Uh, he, he was uh, contributing regularly to the uh, to the early IF community. He's been writing about it regularly on Brass Lantern and other places. So uh, to, to have that, to have it where somebody is impacted by all of that to the point where they want to uh, donate their games, that's, uh, that's something. That's really quite something. I'm um, just checking how we're doing. Uh, yeah, let's keep going. Let's uh, take this up to about an hour. Okay. 
ladies and gentlemen, Chris Crawford. I know Chris is a really good watch, but I'm not going to... The time commitment. Okay, I feel like I know this already. Let's watch this. It takes a long time to make interactive fiction. It really does. Really different from the norm, for one thing, but then also provides a satisfying experience for people. If you're getting paid and you get to do it all the time, it's nine months. And if you're not, then yeah. it's maybe a lot more, you know, or or a few years. My first game, which for the big games. is more of a traditional game and didn't have much innovative stuff in it, I probably worked on for four or five months, the last month being pretty solid working on it in all my free time. Working alone uh, on narcolepsy, uh, which was, you know, fairly straightforward, um, took 14 months. Jeez. My more complicated experiment what, full time? was oh, nine sure. months Part time, surely. two solid months at the end of committing all my time and putting every ounce of effort I had into finishing that game. It is so time intensive. It really is. Uh, to put together... Um, a piece of interactive fiction that goes beyond the short story length. Yes. Now, there are some people who work at it longer, you know, six months. I've known a couple of cases where someone has written me and said, mm. now, I haven't released it before, but I've been working on this game for four years. Is it okay <laughs> if I enter it? And I'm like, uh, okay. Essentially, I am just waiting until I have a year to spare. Um, as soon as I have a year to spare, I'm going to be back with some kind of like really major project. Uh, a lot of people have full-time jobs and, and, and one of the reasons I have taken so long to write is because people have lives. But yeah. I don't know when that will be. I don't even know if that will ever come to pass. It went pretty slowly for the first two or three years of, of the writing of it. Two or three then, years. Um, then I lost my job and it went a lot faster. <laughs> oh man, that's reassuring. So it's not just me then. Um, it really does, and um, and it's like I, I said this funnily enough. That's a really good one, um, because I think earlier on I was saying that you just you have an idea, uh, you write it down, you start to code, and you realise that it's taking you like three hours to code one tiny, tiny bit, it's such a small amount, and then you're like, wow, okay. And then, you know, then you've got to go back to work. You've got to sleep. You've got to eat. You've got to take the kid, you know, the kids out. You've got to get out and about, do things. Um, yeah, you've got to live life, basically. And then um, the the amount of time, particularly I think there's certain points in life when maybe the, the, the stars align, um, like... Uh, Two Star was saying there, uh, he lost his job. So yeah, I mean that's a really good time, I guess. You can have loads of time at that point. But but then again, depending on what your commitments are, because yeah, if you've got the mortgage payments to make and things, people to feed, you're gonna have to be chasing that next job. So um, yeah, I that one really resonated with me. Um, Bob Supnik and Adventure. Let's. Uh, David's Grand Unifying Theory. Let's just go to... Let's watch Bob Supnik, and then we'll do David's Grand Unifying Theory. I joined DEC in 1977 and almost immediately walked into the culture of text adventures uh, on the large time-sharing systems. The particular one that was sort of sweeping deck at the time was uh, Will Crowther's adventure. In fact, it was such a burden to the time-sharing systems of the era that it had been banned from being played during prime time. We were going into prime time hours, we we're gonna shut down all the games, and there was a capability to find all the copies of the games and shut them down more or less simultaneously. It's part of the culture of computing in the 70s that is now unfathomable. I never saw the main machine. It was in a, a large computer room. It required special air conditioning. Uh, these machines are, uh, scale-wise, uh, the equivalent of today's mainframe computers. Uh, multiple cabinets, uh, disk drives that were smaller than uh, the flash cards you're using to record on were the size of washing machines and required uh, 208 power. So. 
Uh, imagine that, that your personal computer was upscaled to the size of an 18-wheeler truck and then downscaled in power and a computing capability to about what's, what's in a, a modern calculator. And that's what we, we had at the time. Crazy. So my thought was to get it off the mainframe, off the time sharing system, and onto the smallest possible mini computer that was widely accessible inside of DEC, which was the PDP-11. Because then anybody would be able to play it at any time. Uh, and uh, of course that included me. <laughs> uh, adventure is it's not that hard a game to work out, the original text adventure. But I was extremely interested in how it had been put together to get the effects it did. It gave, for, for its era, a very realistic interactive feel. Uh, so I really wanted to, to understand them, and what better way to understand them to, than to port it uh, from a large-scale environment to a small one. It became accessible to the Fortran to C converters that had started showing up in the Unix world to help people cope with the fact that in that era of Unix there were no Fortran compilers, or no good Fortran compilers. And at the end, they had truly portable code. Unreadable, but portable. And it's those C versions of Adventure and Dungeon that basically now populate the universe of, of, of uh, these things. I was astounded that uh, we're, we're, we're building an embedded control plane application here on UC Linux. And uh, on this relatively tiny microprocessor, and, and the, the developer booted up the, the UC Linux board, and the first thing he found there was Adventure. That must, that must be good, to know that you've had that direct involvement in it. Um, yeah, I mean, that's he had a fairly fairly important role. It, it's, the full interview is, is worth watching on the, get, on the, the archive website. Uh, to be fair, it's been a few people have put it on, the, on YouTube as well, uh, if you just sort of Google Get Lamp Bob Supnik. That interview is definitely worth watching, as is the Don Woods one, actually, which is about an hour and 20 minutes, so... Uh, you know, you need to sit down with a cup of tea for that one. But yeah, um, yeah, interesting. Let's uh, watch. Okay, let's watch the next one. I I do want to do a lot of, of comparison after the fact, and I think that's something I'm only starting to work towards now, where I'm looking at uh, similar games where the all these games had a bathroom, or all these games had mm. a town, village, you know, and just being struck by how many of them have like a fountain in the middle of them. It's all the same village, you know, <laughs> um, you know, very few weather vanes and games. Uh, why not? Um, you know, just you get to see repeated themes. Um, just, you know, OK, here's a dog. That means there has to be a bone around here to feed it, to get yeah. rid of it, because that's what you do with dogs in <laughs> games. There's a rat, find the cheese. There's a monkey, find the banana. You, you start to recognize that, you know, coal mine, find the di make a diamond. Uh, it, it just gets really bizarre. Never really thought of this was right. Feather. Okay, is this meant to tickle somebody? And if it's not for tickling, what's it good for? You know, you, you know, is it a pen? Because feathers sometimes are pens. If it's a pen, Flight. <laughs> then you have to find what's being used for ink. Uh, you, you, you start recognizing that what can be done with all the different objects, all the, all the puzzles involving mirrors, all the puzzles involving bells. It get, I, I, yeah. got there was right. I am <laughs> obsessive about comparing all this stuff and uh, collating it all. And like I say, I'm just starting oh, to, to figure, got. I think, some of these things out where what's, what's sort of like, uh, I don't even have a word for it yet, the, uh, I guess, the common um, experience or, or the common physics of... Uh, 
Yeah, he's right. I've never really thought about that, but he's absolutely spot on. I think and it shows a couple of things. It shows one is that's the things that when we see the world, that's the things that immediately jump up to us. Like like we were saying earlier, if you go into a room, there's going to be a three-piece suite, uh, a TV, a, uh, a mirror, uh, a window, so on and so forth. It's those kind of regular items that enable you to uh, enable it so that you can just describe in a few lines the room and the brain fills out the rest. And it's and it's that, isn't it? And of course, it, it made me wonder for a minute there if there was like what just one interactive fiction universe <laughs> in the universe of interactive fiction slash text adventure. Uh, what's that doing? Get off. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's that was interesting. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next. One. Oh, do we want to watch The Grew? Let's watch The Grew. The Grew was actually invented by Jack Vance, who, in my opinion at least, is one of the greatest science fiction and fantasy writers ever. Oh. He wrote a series of stories set Jack billions Vance of years died. in the future, and they're collectively known as the Dying Earth series because the sun is about to go out. And there are all these strange monsters that wander around, and there's magic, and it's actually a very Zorkish kind of environment. There's a lot of tongue-in-cheek humor and a lot Might of sarcasm, which there's a little of in Zork. And <laughs> one of the monsters that wanders around is a thing called a Gru. Now, Jack ah. Vance's Grus are nothing like the Grus in Zork, but the name, that's where the name comes from. Cool. They came into Zork because when we first wrote the game, it was a lot like Adventure. If you wandered around in the dark, you would fall in a pit. However, that meant that you could fall in pits in the attic of the house. You could fall hmm. in pits in dark places where there couldn't possibly be a pit. And after a while, I just said, look, we're not going to have pits. We're going to have something that kills you. We're going to have a monster. Yeah. And I thought for a while, and I came up with, okay, it's going to be called a Gru. And the rest is either history or comedy. I'm not sure which. For a while, it was a it was an almost explicit policy that every game had to have a Gru in it. It's like it's like Even Acme, isn't Suspect, it? Suspect, which was a real world present day murder mystery, had a horse that was a you know a racehorse that was named by one of the suspects group. called Lurking Gru. So there was definitely a certain uh, it was a MacGuffin, it was a motif, it was a it was a thing that we kept doing over and over because we thought it was amusing. Excellent. Yeah, uh, I'm going to uh, go check out those books, actually. That was very interesting. Okay. Uh, okay, let's... Okay, so we're on to the last page now. Uh, there was a bear. Bugs and testing, Floyd, photo... Oh, wow, I, I could happily watch all of these. I don't know if we, how we're doing for time. Uh, I was going to try and keep this to an hour, but uh, let's definitely do a mind for voyaging, for sure. Let's definitely do this. Big fan of this game. So A Mind Forever Voyaging is a game where you actually play a computer with a consciousness. And your job as this computer is to simulate 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years into the future what the world around you is going to be like after a particular politician's policies are put in place. The way that it works is you are the simulator, but you're also a character in the simulation. There's, there's, it's a bit hard to describe, but there's multiple levels of, of character. The, the outermost level is you're this computer that does this simulation. But when the simulation begins, you are a human within the small town that you're simulating. You could wander around this, this seemingly vast city um, and just explore and see how things changed over time. And certainly to me, that was a heck of a lot more interesting than like, you know, fixing spaceships and, and so forth. You have a girlfriend and you have a job and you have these various, um, you have a life within this simulation. You're asked to go into the simulation that's 10 years in the future from now and um, see what life is like after these policies. Got all those in items. Place. You're asked to do it 20 years from now and then 30 and 40 years from now. And the situation where these authoritarian measures have been sort of put in place, and that is what is improving life in the short term. And then as it gets 
uh, later and later into the simulation, um, life degenerates and and uh, it becomes more of a police state. Yeah, I mean it's a completely different approach to the game and the storytelling in that you're sort of playing in this role of jumping into different environments and then coming out and see how you affect events. And that's a really cool game design, which I'd love to see brought into more games today. I wouldn't have been aware enough at the time, just just being out of high school, to hmm. recognize um, yeah. social political commentary if it had hit me upside the head. Uh, I just thought it was a fascinating premise. To me, it was good science fiction, right? Yeah. I, I wouldn't have been able to tell the difference between good science fiction and, and social commentary. So, so I can't offer a perspective other than saying, you know, it was enjoyable writing. I, I enjoyed playing it. And very different from the usual vein of his, he does usually more comedy, silly, either science fiction or fantasy kind of games, but this was very serious, uh, I mean, I suppose you could call it social satire, but it was, all, it was really social mm. commentary. I remember Woody Allen movie, Interiors? It was sort of his first serious movie after, after all his comedies. Hollywood, Dave Anderson, who was uh, the head of testing while I was doing a Mind Forever Voyaging, he would often refer to it as Steve Moretzky's Interiors. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I can see why. I mean, where, where it came from was kind of, you know, a growing realization that people playing these games were just really obsessed by them. You know, they'd be on your mind even when you weren't playing. And, and it was something that, that would be on your mind, not just, you know, for, for a day or two, but for weeks or even months. If a movie can change people's minds, you know, because they focus on it for a couple hours and then maybe think about it for the next day or two, mm. um, then, then so much more for a game. Simultaneously, um, this was, you know, Reagan had just been reelected by a landslide, despite, in, in my opinion, him being the worst or, you know, perhaps behind Nixon as the second worst president of my lifetime. And so those two, you know, kind of brain threads converged on the idea of using uh, an Infocom game to try to change people's minds about what was going on in the country politically. A Mind for Voyaging is a piece that's very, very influential to me. Uh, it's interesting because it's a complete commercial failure. Uh, it was uh, the first of the Interactive Fiction Plus games with new hardware requirements that came out from Infocom. It wasn't in exactly in the typical genre lineup that Infocom had. Mm. One and, of the lowest um, selling, geez. Uh, it was a flop, uh, as far as I can tell, commercially. Its reception was definitely mixed. A lot of the uh, rabid, puzzle-loving fans did well, not like it. They might have liked the politics, or maybe they didn't like the How politics, but, but, but some people did, did not like the, the lack of puzzles. And, but for me, it was like, great, look, we can really elicit a, an emotional response. And it, an emotional response which, is, which isn't, isn't trite. But uh, it also really worked to show this uh, transformed environment over time to present mm. uh, a political critique to show, you know, how it, how it could be that conservative policy dealing with immigration, security, and so forth might look oh, good that's how it tracks 10 it. years into the future and yet might lead to long-term decline. And, um, and then at the same time, it was uh, posing interesting sorts of <laughs> questions, not that they were uh, completely new to science fiction, but um, interesting sorts of questions about computer consciousness and the fact that the main character was a simulated person, a computer system, who was able to enter the uh, simulated real world of this interactive fiction and explore it was, you know, an additional, uh, very intricate, fascinating aspect on top of all these other things. Yeah. It, it, over time, it's just like the film Blade Runner, isn't it, or something? It's just picked up pace over time. So that was, you know, that was my mission with with a mind forever voyaging. I wanted to, uh, you know, kind of to show uh, people, you know, what a uh, warmongering, you know, Christian right pandering, environmental trashing, uh, you know, rights trampling asshole Reagan was. Mm -hmm. um, and of course the game was so successful we've never had another president like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, man.
And the the funny bit, well, the funny slash worst bit, I guess, about that one is, uh, I mean, I, look, I'm not going to get political, so I'm going to stay strict down the middle, because uh, that's where I sit politically. But anyway, yeah. Uh, but but the interesting point about that is, of course, it, 2006, seven when this was recorded, um, you hadn't even got uh, a President Trump yet. <laughs> so, oh man, I bet Steve Bretsky was uh, just planning on writing a mind forever voyage in the sequel when that happened. Uh, which, you know, whoever you voted for, it's, it's all good. Just go do it. <laughs> I'm not going to get involved in a political thing. Uh, okay, let's do... Uh, that was a bear bug testing, Floyd. Uh, Photopia. I love Photopia. It's one of my favorite games of all time. So I think we're going to check this out, and then we're going to call it time. Photopia is an example of... Uh a game that doesn't really have puzzles. Uh, it's a questionable as to whether it's a game, um, and mm. uh, I don't think Adam Cadre would call it that. I happened to be up against it with another game, and I had been, you know, of course I'm nervous about all the other people, you know, how good is my game, how's it gonna be received, so I'm playing through them, and it's like, oh, that's crap, that's crap, that's pretty good, oh, I don't know, that's about on my level, and then I hit Photopia, and it's like, this is something completely different. There are these disconnected perceptions and perspectives that we have to put together to, to see the story of one particular girl by going through these different interactive fiction worlds, mm. seeing what's happening there and assembling everything. This is so far and away beyond what we're doing over here um, that it was very obviously, uh, at least in my mind, going to place, if not very high, it, 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 I was expecting it to place first, but at least place very high. So uh, I think that's a case where it was far and away beyond what uh, the other games in the competition were doing. Okay, fourth. Photopia so took six weeks um, because, wow. again, six weeks. Um, it is short story sized, um, and the types of interaction that it allows um, are, are fairly, you know, tightly restrained. Um, you know, you can interact within uh, certain limits, but but that's really. That's that's really all you get. Such a great game. I found it a really great game. Slash story. You know, I, I walked out of the suite hereafter and um, I wanted to, uh, you know, come up with something uh, that was, you know, more you know, literary and trying to be beautiful rather than something that's full of puzzles and trying to be a challenging game. Um, it's, it's not like I just sort of, you know, made up a story uh, trying to produce an emotional reaction. It's like when I when I thought about, um, you know, what what is it that I have within my myself uh, to share with people. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, um, you know, try to evoke um, was uh, the the feeling of of my own sister's death uh, back, you know, many years ago. Photopia yep. was certainly a touchstone for the interactive fiction community. Uh, got a lot of people talking. The fact that it was undeniably uh, a serious story. It was one in which the player did not have the freedom to prevent a tragic occurrence. Uh, that was really the heart of that experience. So he did not come from it as sort of an exercise in nostalgia or an exercise mm. in trying to recapitulate what had happened before. He was coming at it as a completely new art form. It was hard to deny that uh, there was something interactive fiction-like going on in this, um, and it got people uh, it got people thinking um, along a number of dimensions about uh, what IF could do. To the extent that uh, people were moved by by Ali's death, um, you know, it wasn't just me saying, you know, ha ha, score! I managed to produce this emotional effect, you know look at what a master of the, you know, literary arts I am. It's still an ending that, uh, that many people find shocking because they don't expect the story to end at that particular point. Uh, you know, I was, I was sharing, um, you know, a, a pretty deep part of my emotional life with people and the fact that uh, Photopia and the medium of interactive fiction allowed me to do that in a way that a lot of other media couldn't 
um, is is pretty pretty significant when I, I think back about uh, on on the things that that I've I've done you know creatively speaking. After I finished playing the game and realized what had happened, I replayed the game, trying to do something about it. And hmm. of course, as did we all. To do. Um, <laughs> yeah, we all tried and it. I replayed it again, and I realized that at the very beginning of the game, you start off and you're a passenger in a car, and this is the car that's destined to crash into the other car and kill the girl. I always get out of the car. Man, to be let out of the car and let, left on the side of the road, and the car speeds off without you and goes off on its date with destiny. But you weren't there. Mm. You weren't, didn't have to do it yourself. And I, that was the, the only thing I got out of Utopia that I could actually had control over. And it let, let me do it, actually. And there's actually another part in the game later on where you hear a snippet of conversation of, at, in the hospital. So the line, drunk frat boys, shows up. Oh, frat boys. And when I replayed the game, I replayed the game all the way up to that part again, just so that they wouldn't say drunk frat boys, but they would say drunk frat boy. Yes. Because I wasn't in the car. There was only one guy left. And it actually, uh, I played it and I was all excited to get that, rid of that S and it was still there. And I was so disappointed <laughs> and I sent it in as a bug report. It's like, if I get out of the car, yes. that S should be gone. That, that's my contribution to the story is to delete an S from one word. Um, you know, complicity, especially with what Lucian was talking about vis-a-vis um, -vis whether you can get out of the car at, at the beginning of uh, the program. Um, that, at, you know, you, you may not actually save Ali, but um, at least you are not as directly complicit as somebody who is actually in the vehicle yeah. uh, that kills her. So what I did in my own head was I uh, since all you hear is drunk frat boys, then the unheard context is then what I could change in the, in the, in the story in my head. Was someone no longer is saying drunk frat boys crashed into the car, but they are saying, oh, it must have been one of those drunk frat boys or something like that. Um, but it wasn't me. <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> uh, that's cool. Yeah, I can talk about Photopia forever. Um, it's a great game slash story slash experience, whatever you want to call it. And it's interesting because obviously, I mean, it's over, well over 20 years old now. Um, and I think if you raise it now, um, you'll, you'll generally get a lot of agreement, but you'll also probably get now, I think it's fair to say a lot of people say, well, yeah, but there's actually better examples of X now since then because it was 20 years ago but but for me it still holds up as solid as it ever did and um there's not really anything else i still don't feel there's anything else really like it uh i think it's still kind of on its own there's other stuff that goes there's other stuff that's spiraled off of it and is you could put in the same pot um but yeah it's still kind of on its own it is true interactive fiction because um it's a podcaster that I listened to called Keith McNally, and he did an entire episode where he basically turned Photopia into a, a radio play, effectively. It's really worth listening to if you get the chance. And um, But there's a second one he did, where, which is more of a review. And he was saying that, you know, it, interactive fiction, it's a little bit of a misnomer in some cases, because often it is just, you know, uh, solve a puzzle, uh, find a treasure. Ultimately, there's a story there, but it's still puzzles, still broken down by puzzles. Um, whereas in, whereas Photopia is interactive fiction. It's a fiction, it's a story, it's a narrative that you get to tinker around with a little bit, go in certain directions, but it's ultimately going to weave you to the same destination. So, yeah, I... Yeah, 10 out of 10 every time for me, that one. Okay, um, look, that's it. Let's wrap this up uh, because we've been going for over an hour. So I uh, hope you've enjoyed that uh, little magical mystery tour. <clears throat> I'm losing my voice <clears throat> of the GetLab uh, DVD extras. Uh, I'm going to call it time next. I'm losing my voice, as you can hear. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you, and uh, I'll see you in the next video. Take care.